Man, look, y'all, we back, we back. Yeah, got shut down twice. I actually just went and cleared a flood in my basement, did a little bit of work, and I said, you know what? We about to hop right back on here and talk about Jesus. We're not going to let it stop us. So um, I doubt everyone who was just on the stream an hour ago is going to come back, especially since it's pretty late here on the East Coast. But regardless, we're going to get this video done tonight. It's going to be good. And I am excited. So I'm going to hop right into this. There's going to be no delay and I'm start from the beginning. And it's going to be good. So let's go ahead and get my screen ready to share. And we will get a drink and we'll start from there. Thank you, Lord Jesus. All right, so today we're going to talk about false prophets in the church and how they entice or seduce God's people to fornication. Now, fornication is not primarily sexual sin in the Bible, and we're going to see that here very soon. And even Jezebel, that woman, as it calls her in Revelation, is not primarily a sexual seductress, but we're going to see how she seduces the church and what she seduces them to. Now, this video is going to benefit not only those who are in ministry to, you know, watch their hearts in the 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 temptations and the motives of their heart so that they don't end up as false. Because no one, I don't think too many people uh, decide or, or just they wake up one day and they say, I'm going to be a false prophet. This is what I want to be, right? Things entice you, things seduce you. Uh, uh, the lusts of the flesh get a hold of you and they lead us uh, astray. It's going to help us to be able to spot false prophets, and it's also going to be able to teach us to not be seduced by them, right? So it's going to help people on all sides. So we're going to learn, we're going to grow, and it is going to be good. So I'm really about to repeat everything that I just said an hour ago, but regardless, God's word is good all the time. So like we said, we're going to start here in Revelation. We're going to talk about Jezebel. We're going to talk about Balaam. And we're going to make sure that we don't fall for these things that are still effective in our church. Now, in the churches, uh, you know, in America and all over the world, even in our day, because I want to be clear, these were real churches uh, in the first century that had real issues that, that Jesus uh, was speaking to. I know a lot of times with the book of Revelation, we uh, woo-woo spiritualize everything, the entire book. Um, but a lot of these things were actually going on. They were really, really happening. And it's going to show how Jesus is intimately involved in his church, not just these churches, but the church, period. Now, you can see here, unto the church, the angel of the church of Ephesus, he writes, these things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience. How canst, how thou canst not bear with them that are evil and has tried them, which they say, which say they are apostles and are not. Now, this is specifically for the church of Ephesus, but this is Jesus. It says, that this is the revelation, the revealing, the unveiling of Jesus Christ, right? And he's writing to these seven churches. He's warning them of the coming tribulation. And the seven stars we see are the angels of the seven churches and the seven candlesticks are the actual churches. And Jesus walks in the midst of these churches 
He's walking in the midst of these church and, and he sees what they're going through, right? And we're going to focus primarily on the church of Pergamum and the third, the church of Theatera because of the fornication that the leaders of those churches enticed and seduced them into, right? Because that's what we're focusing on today, the fornication. Now, to the angel of the church of Pergamus, write these things, saith he, that hath a sharp sword with two edges. Now, you'll notice, especially if you read all seven um, rebukes, they're, they're all not rebukes, some of them are commendations, that Jesus announces himself in different ways in proportion to what he is about to say, because he sees them, he's in the midst of them, and he is the one on this rock that he is the Christ, he is building his church. So he says, I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even in Satan's, where Satan's seed is, and thou holdest fast my name and has not denied my faith, even in those days where Antipas was my faithful servant, martyr, who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth, right? Now, uh, I showed this before, but I don't have the tab up right now. But in this church, they called it the seat of Satan. There were so many false gods, the temple of Dionysus, the temple of Athena, uh, the, the Pergamum temple, the the temple of uh, Antipas, which they had, um, well, not Antipas. Antipas is the the person that, that got martyred. Uh, but they had a temple where they practiced healing and people came from all around and it was a hospital, but it was a pagan hospital where these false prophets. So they had all of this stuff going on. And, and Jesus says, you're in the seat of Satan. You are in the midst of uh, this hell everywhere. So he sees that, he understands that. People are even getting martyred there. And Jesus is intimately aware of that. But he also has a rebuke. Why? Because it's not just about what you're doing that's good. But if what you're doing something that's evil, Jesus is not going to have that in his church. And we're going to see that here in a second. He says, I have a few things against you. Because you have them there that hold to the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak, to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit fornication. Now, we looked at this word fornication, and it means someone who sells themselves to the lust of others. Okay? So the fornication is you prostituting yourself out for something else. All right? And we're going to see this very clearly, especially when it comes to Esau, because it says Esau committed fornication when he sold his birthright for some stew, for some beans, all right, for some soup. They call it fornication. And we're going to see that whenever we get to Jezebel and to eat food sacrificed to idols, to be sustained by seeking after these other gods. Right, these these idolatrous idolatrous motives is what is nourishing and sustaining you, and he also says that you have them to hold to the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. And the Nicolaitans were those that ruled over the laity, that dominated the laity, that that instead of them serving the laity, they actually feel like the laity should serve them. The people that God loves, that God is serving, that God called them to teach and grow. And they're supposed to be the ones that are growing these people in God's word. They're ruling over them and having them serve them. Not It's not okay. And God hates these doctrines. Okay. Now, here in 2 Peter, we see that he mentions Balaam. He says, forsaking the right way, let, let's start right here. They have eyes full of idolatry, insatiable for sin. They entice unsteady souls. They have hearts trained in greed, accursed children. Okay, so they 
these false prophets that what Peter is talking about here, these false prophets that are teaching people destructive heresies, damnable heresies, denying our master, they follow after sensuality, they're causing the truth, the way of Jesus to be blasphemed. People all over the world right now are you now this is not okay. They're not going to get away with this, but this is how God sees it. There are these false prophets, these false teachers, and they're actually causing people to hate Jesus. They're causing people to hate Jesus. This is wild, right? And it says their greed and in their greed, they exploit you. They make merchandise of you. And this is what the doctrine of Balaam is. He makes merchandise of you. You are here for his benefit. And remember, we're talking about false prophets. You are here for his benefit. You are here for his pockets to get fat. You are here for his gain. So they exploit you. They make merchandise of you with false words. And they're uh, condemnation from long ago is not idle and their destruction is not asleep. So he goes on and he talks about these false prophets. Their eyes are full of idolatry and they entice unsteady souls. So people who are not grounded in the gospel, these people are easily enticed. It says it again right here. It says that they speak, they speaking loudly, boasts of folly. They entice by sensual passions of the flesh, those who are barely escaping from those who live in error. So people who are barely escaping sin, people who are barely escaping out of darkness, th these false prophets are seducing them by the lust of the flesh. And even though they're promising people freedom, Oh my goodness, if you guys stick through this, it's going to it's going to be so good. Even though they're promising people freedom, they are actually themselves slaves of corruption. For whatever overcomes a person that he is enslaved to. Another place it mentions Balaam is right here in Jude. It says these people blaspheme all that do not understand, and they are destroyed by all that they, like unreasoning animals, understand instinctively. Woe to them, for they walked in the way of Cain and abandoned themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's error and perished in Korah's rebellion, right? So Jesus rebukes these people. He does not like false prophets. He does not like what they are enticing these people to do. He, he is very angry with it, and he's telling them, I see what you're doing. I see where you're living. I see where you're putting up with. But why do you have these people in your midst? Why are you allowing this to happen? I will have no parts of it. And we're going to see his rebuke right down here. He says, repent or else. <laughs> Can you imagine? Now, listen, this is, this is Jesus. This is the one with a sharp two-edged sword in his mouth. He's coming to the dividing of the soul and the spirit. This is the rebuke from the mouth of the Lord. And listen what he tells them. Repent or else I will come unto thee quickly. This is judgment, right? And I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Now, let's go ahead and look at what Balak did. So Balaam, Balak sends for Balaam, and we're going to go through this kind of quickly, but I want you guys to hear. It. So long story short, over the course of these next nine chapters, Balaam is called to the king of the Midianites, Balaam, and he is offering Balaam money for cursing Israel. Now, Balaam is a real prophet, a true prophet actually called of God, as opposed to what we're going to see here in a little while, uh, Jezebel. Jezebel is not a real prophet, okay? But Balaam is a real prophet. He even prophesied of the coming of the Lord, right? That This is a real prophet. This is called of God. He has accurate prophecies. Now, I want you to hear me. 
because it's not the accurate prophecies, that obviously that's not what made him a false prophet. Okay, he had accurate prophecies, but he's still a false prophet because of the motives of his heart. So he calls him, he tells him, I want you to curse Israel. It's what I want you to do. I want you to curse Israel. Let's do it. So then they go up, they build these altars. He goes to curse Israel. He, go, he, he, he listens for the Lord and he can't do it. He says, how can I curse what God has blessed? Balak gets upset. Balak gets upset. He says, do it again. He lifts up his eyes. He seeks God again. And he blesses Israel again. Okay. And it goes on and on and on. But after seven times and he keeps blessing these people, Balak gets upset and he just leaves. But look at this, what happens here. It says, and Israel abode in Shittim, and the people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. And they called the people unto sacrifices of their gods, and the people did eat and bowed down to their gods. So this is what Jesus is referring to. And Israel joined himself to Baal Peor. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And the Lord said unto Moses, take all the heads of the people and hang them before the Lord against the sun, that the fierce anger of the Lord may be turned away from Israel. And Moses said unto the judges of Israel, slay thee every one his men that were joined unto Baal Peor. And behold, one of the children of Israel came and brought unto his brother a Midianitish woman in the sight of Moses and in the sight of all the congregation of the children of Israel who were weeping before the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And then it just goes on and tells exactly what happened, right? He went after the man of Israel into the tent and thrust both of them through the man of Israel and the woman through her belly. So the plague was stayed from the children of Israel and those that died in the plague were 24,000. Now, we're going to see here where Paul is telling us about children of Israel and all of their mistakes. He also mentions this, but he does not mention Baal necessarily. He mentions the people. These things were written as an example to us to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted, right? Neither be idolaters as some of them were, as it is written, the people sit down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day, three and 20,000, right? So here it says 23,000. Back here, it says 24,000. Now, whenever you read this, it actually doesn't say anything about Baal, uh, Balaam giving up this information to Baal, okay, uh, to, to Balak. It doesn't say that. It's not until chapter 31 that we actually find this out. And this is why it's very important to read your Bible in context, right? All of these chapters and verses, is not they were not part of this, this story. All right. So you can't just hop in and hop around and think you came to the conclusion. It tells us right here that Moses said that Balaam, that Balaam is the one who let Balak know how to entice the children of Israel. He sold them out. Right. Behold, these caused the children of Israel through the counsel of Balaam to commit trespass unto the Lord in the matter of Peor. So now this is what happened. Balaam was a true prophet, so he could not curse. He could not curse Israel. He was only going to say what God said. But what he did was he told Balaam. Balak, how to get Israel to curse themselves. Okay. He taught 
Balak how to get Israel to curse themselves. So he got Balak to send in the women that caused the men to prostitute, commit. See, it doesn't say that the women committed whoredom. It says that the children of Israel committed whoredom with them. They sold themselves out for the unholy women. They, instead of pursuing the war that they were supposed to be fighting, gave up that to go after these evil women, to eat food sacrificed of idols. They gave themselves up for that which was unholy. Okay? Do you understand that? And in doing that, Balaam did not have to curse them. He sold them out. Now, this is why we have to be very careful. And I'm going to show you guys this in a second. This is why we have to be very careful. Because it's not just what's coming out of people's mouths that make them a false prophet. It's the motive and intent of their heart. Now, God is going to deal with them. But if you watch the fruit that's coming out around them, then you'll be able to notice. Now, let's go ahead and look at this as Jesus finishes his rebuke. He says, he that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the spirit says unto the churches. Right. He tells them to repent or else he's going to come and bring judgment quickly. He's going to bring the sword of his mouth. But he that has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. To him that overcometh, I will give him the hidden manna, right? So as opposed to the food sacrificed to idols, as opposed to being sustained by going after these other gods, these idolatrous things that God is not calling holy, by letting the by, by not being sustained by the evil pursuits of your heart and selling out. He's going to give you the hidden manna or what he calls in Luke, the true riches. See, if you haven't been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit unto you the true riches? What does he tell us here? He says here in Colossians, even the mystery, that which was hid from the ages and from generations, but now is made manifest unto his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of his glory. It's not money. Money is not the riches of his glory. Of the mystery among the Gentiles, what is it? It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. He even tells us here that their hearts might be comforted being knit together in love unto all the riches of the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father of Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So the true riches is not found in material wealth. The true riches is found in the revelation of this thing that Jesus Christ in us is the hope of glory. And the revelation of him in you is the true riches of God. You have God with you personally. Now, let's go back and listen to the rest of his rebuke. So he's going to give you the hidden manna to eat, the hidden manna, the food from heaven. And he will give you a white stone and the stone, a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving that he received it. Right. So this is the mystery. This is the fact that you've been named after him. You've received his name. This white stone thing. I'm going to let you guys. because I really want you guys to start doing this research on your own. If you go here and you click on it, it will tell you that a white stone is that given to people that receive acquittal. All right. To those that are acquitted of their crime. So not only are you acquitted. But you receive in this stone, you're given his name. You receive the very name of the Lord. And instead of having to be sustained by food from your heart going after this or your heart going after that or your heart going after. No, no, no. You're going to receive the hidden manna from heaven. 
food that will sustain you. Right? You're never going to thirst or hunger anymore because you've received him. You understand that? So what Balak does is he seduces the people. But what Balaam does is he's the one who merchandises you. He's the one that is going to tell he now he's really called, but his heart is evil. And he's going to sell you out. He's only going to tell you what it is that you want to hear, that you need to hear, uh, that you really want to hear from the desires of your heart so that he can keep making money. He's not going to tell you what you need to hear. He's not going to tell you what God is saying. He's not going to take any chances of saying something that might upset you. Why? It's for profit. And if someone comes along and offers enough money, he will sell you. Uh, let me bring this person in. They're offering me $5,000 to, to speak to you. Oh, this person. It doesn't matter what these people are teaching you. As long as money is flowing and they're seducing you, remember everything that we read out of 2 Peter and out of Jude, they're giving you the desires of your heart. So they're going to teach you, oh, God wants you to, and God wants you to, and don't you want, and da, 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 and no, no, because it's all for profit. They give you the American dream gospel and tell you that, that being successful as far as the American success story is exactly what God is calling you to. And I'm not saying God wants you to be broke. I'm not saying God wants you to be this. I'm not saying, no. But what I'm saying is they sell you a dream because that's what you want to hear. They will preach, they will sound like every motivational preacher, a uh, teacher, every, uh, picture Gary V saying Jesus, right? I don't know if you guys know who Gary V, picture Gary V and he sprinkled some Jesus in there. Picture, picture Tony Robbins and saying Jesus in there. That's what these people do. They're really called of God, but their motivation is money. And they will sell you out so that you will fornicate, so that you will fornicate and give up your birthright, give up the name of Christ, give up the hidden riches to sell, you, to sell out for this thing that's actually worth it. Filthy lucre, mammon. Do you hear that? What's up, bro? Do you hear that? Filthy lucre, mammon. You will sell it for that. All right? Now, let's go ahead and move on to this woman, Jezebel. Now, and unto the angel of the church of Theatera, write, these things saith the Son of God, who hath eyes like a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. Now, he commends them. I know your works, your charity, your love, and your service, and your faith, and your patience, and your works, and the last to be more than the first, notwithstanding I have a few things against you. So remember, this is Jesus. He's the one that walks in the midst of the churches. He is the one that holds the stars or the leaders of the churches in his hands. Right? He's going he's gonna to exalt. He's going to bring judgment. He will remove you. He will remove the church or he will commend you. He's not playing about this stuff. Now, he says, because you suffer that, that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess to teach 
and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed to idols. So both of these prophets, though one is a real prophet, Balaam is a true prophet, but he's greedy. This woman, Jezebel, is not a real prophet. She calls herself a prophet. Now, I want you guys to see what Jezebel means. Now, we actually have to go to the old covenant so that we can click on this and you guys can hear what Jezebel actually means, because it's not just about fornication and sexual sin, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So Jezebel, Jezebel equals Bel exalt or Bel is a husband to. Now, look at this. It says, perhaps suggesting to the Hebrew ear the idea of unexalted or unhusband. Okay? Unhusband. Here, you guys can go check this out at the Jewish Virtual Library. It says that Jezebel means, where is the exalted one? Or where is my prince? Where is the divine presence? All right. She is the, uh, she she serves Baal. She is uh, the, the daughter of Eth Baal. So what Jezebel is, is this ungoverned woman. And it's not just, when I say woman, you'll see why it talks about her as a woman in a second because it, it's the un it's the one that is not under the Lord God Yahweh but one that does serve a lord but her lord is Baal her lord is the false god she's not governed by the true god she's unhusbanded she's ungoverned she's unwed but she calls herself a prophetess now listen and she teaches and seduces my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed to idols. I gave her space to repent of her fornication and she did not repent. Now, I want you guys to see something. I want you guys to see something here. And then we're going to go back to talking about that woman, Jezebel. Hebrews here mentions fornication, talking about. Esau. So it says, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any bit of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. And you know, Hebrews is talking about not slipping back and not retreating from God's grace. We just read that in Jude as well, right? They do disgrace to the grace of God and they teach us to go after other things. They teach our heart to pursue unholy things lest there be any fornicator or profane or unholy person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. And we know that afterward, he would have inherited the blessing. He was rejected for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. So fornication is not just sexual sin. Esau committed fornication when he sold his birthright for a meal, for food. Okay? So let's look at it. It says, Jacob sawed pottage, and Esau came from the field, and he was faint. And Esau said to Jacob, feed me, I pray thee, with the same red pottage, for I am faint. Therefore, his name is called Edom, red. Right. And Jacob said, sell me this day your birthright. And Esau said, and Esau said, behold, I am at the point to die. And what profit shall this birthright do me? And Jacob said, swear to me this day. And he swore unto him and he sold his birthright to Jacob. Now, this is happening to people every single day day. And then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage and lentils, and he did eat and drink and rose up and went his way. And thus Esau despised his birthright. He had a low opinion 
of his birthright. He did not realize what he was called to. And in a moment of temporary hunger, because he was about to die. Yo, come on, man. Listen to this. Okay. Oh, oh, sorry. I want to show you this. Look, he sold his blessing. He would have inherited the blessing. He was rejected and he found no repentance. Esau sold. Who do we serve? We serve the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Not Esau. Not Esau. Why? He was hungry. He wanted food. He needed temporary, he needed temporary sustenance. Can you imagine that? He realized it eventually. He ended up crying. He ended up shedding tears. He wanted to get, he couldn't get it back. He threw it away. It's called fornication. He prostituted his, he prostituted who God called him to be for food. He prostituted who God created him to be for a meal. That's fornication. It's not just sex. Right? The men of Israel, they committed whoredom with unholy women. They took for themselves. See, if they would have just took for themselves brought people, women of Egypt, I mean, women of Israel, there would have not been nothing wrong with that. They would have just served their own God. There would have been nothing wrong with that. No, 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 no. They slept with those women. They served those gods, those idols. They fed themselves with meat, from not the manna from God, not what God was sustaining them with while he was bringing them into the promised land. No, they had to fill their belly serving their gods. And this is what Jezebel, this ungoverned, this unhusband, this where is my prince, don't, don't care anything about God, don't know nothing about God. And I'm going to show you guys this, this thing that we talk about here on this channel a lot in one second. No, no. But she's enticing you to seek after these things. She calls herself a prophetess. She calls herself a prophetess, but she's actually the enemy of the prophet. Jezebel is actually the spokesperson for the enemies of the true prophets of God. Right? So that has nothing to do with sexual sin. And this is where you got to be careful because we look on the outward appearance. We make it about male and female. We look on the outward appearance of someone and say, oh, because they look like this or because they look like that. And it's what they are enticing people to. You're looking at someone and they're dressed a certain way and you call them a Jezebel. Meanwhile, there's someone over here that looks the part, that looks modest, that looks humble, that is playing the game and seducing you to go after that which is unholy to go after that which God calls profane. Do you understand that? Now, I want you guys to see this. I want you guys to see this. This woman, Jezebel, she calls herself a prophet and she teaches to seduce, she teaches and seduces his servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Now, Jesus says he gave her space to repent for her fornication and she did not repent. And look what he says, I will cast her into a bed and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. Now, you see, he uses the word fornication 
when it comes to your birthright. He he uses the word fornication when it comes to that which you are wasting your energy on doing. You're wasting your energy going after unholy things instead of seeking after him and the true riches and what he has called you to and what he has created you for. And I'm not talking about just being in ministry. I'm talking about the motivations of your heart, which you see right here in a second. Okay. But he uses adultery when it comes to him because they're his people. They're his servants. They're his bride. He's married to them. And this woman is causing his people to fornicate. So he calls it adultery. You're causing my people to, to divide from me, to, to give themselves to something else, to another God, to another Lord, Baal. And he says, I'm going to cast you into a bed. And those who may c commit adultery with her, he's going to cast her into a bed and those who follow after her. So now it's not just this, this woman that they're suffering that they're allowing to spread this nonsense in their church. But those who follow after her, he's going to give them great tribulation, great stress, great trial. The thing that they won after, okay, the same exact thing that happened to Esau. He got what he wanted, but he didn't want what he got. He got what he wanted, but when he got it, it wasn't everything he thought it was. It wasn't all it was cracked up to be. And it caused great torment. It caused great tribulation. He sold his birthright for a bowl of, for a bowl of beans. He got his food. And afterward, he regretted it. It was torment to him. It was vexing to him. So these people, these false prophets, Balaam, Jezebel, they're teaching us to go after these things, to seek these things. And Jesus is not going to stop it. And we've actually had an example of this recently when it comes to Hillsong. What happened? He's not unaware of that. He sees that. He sees what's going on. You're going to get what you were seeking after. I'm going to let you build it. I'm going to let you go after it. it but what it, it's going to be a sick bed to you. And it's going to be great tribulation. I'm trying to get you to repent. I'm telling you that that's not what I'm calling you for. I'm telling you that those things aren't real riches. And I'm going to allow you to get it. And when you get it, it's going to be vexing. It's going to be tribulation. It's going to be like a sick bed. Now, I want you to hear this next thing. And he says he's going to kill her children with death. So he's going to let it come upon you. He's going to let you get what you're going after. He's going to let you, you, he's trying to get you to repent. But we've been seduced and we're going to build our own kingdom. That woman Jezebel, she's unhusband. She's not building the kingdom of God. She's building something else. It looks like the kingdom of God. It looks like she's blessed. It looks like she's, but no, no. She's building her own kingdom, building her own thing. God is going to let her get it. And everyone that's building it with her, and it's going to be vexing to them. But He's not, he's going to reveal it for what it is. He's not going to let that nonsense, the children that come from that, he's not going to let that doctrine stand. And you'll see it right here. Why? And all the churches shall know that I am he that searcheth the reins and hearts. And I will give unto everyone according to your works. So what is he talking about? He's talking about the heart motivations. 
So he's not just talking about some regular random woman Jezebel spirit. He's talking about the motivations of the heart. One is greedy and the other one is completely ungoverned by him doing their own thing, seeking after things that are not from God. He sees the intent and the motivations, the reins in the heart. And I'm going to show you a different translation in a second because I want you guys to see this. He gives to everyone according to their works. If it's not built on the foundation of Christ, it will not stand. He's going to kill that. He has, his eyes are flame of fire. He sees into the heart. He knows what we're preaching. If right now I'm preaching to you, the Lord knows why. (laughs) Listen to this. Listen to this. Right now I'm preaching to you and the Lord knows why. Every minister of the gospel, the Lord knows the intent and motives of their heart. We think we can just do and say what we want. We think we can just let our emotions and say, thus saith the Lord. You know what I, you know what I seen today? You know how I feel today? You know what's going on in the world? Thus saith the Lord. Thus saith you. These false prophets, they use sensuality, their emotions. Jude says their dreams. Every time they have a dream, they say, thus saith the Lord. That ain't even from God. That ain't even from God. Think we're allowed to thus saith the Lord anything that comes out of our mind, completely ungoverned by God. Purely carnal. These things are in the church. God knows it. Jesus knows it because it's his church that he's building. And that's why we see these things that go on and one day they come crumbling. That's the judgment of Jesus. He's like, I wasn't going to let that. You thought I was going to let that slide. Look like you were profitable, profitable. Like he cares about the money. He cares about the doctrine. He cares about what's going on in the hearts. He cares about that people are growing in him. And that's one danger about what's going on in America is that we think where the money flows, that that means God has blessed it. Right? That that mean God has blessed it. And this happened actually in more like Laodicea was one of those churches. Right? So now let's, let me, let's keep going because I want you guys to see this one last part. But unto you, I say, And unto the rest of Theotera, as many as have not this doctrine and which have not known the depths of Satan, as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden. Now, I want you guys to see this real quick. (laughs) Look at this. But to the rest of you in Theotera, who do not hold this teaching, what this false teaching, these doctrines that these false prophets who, who, who are greedy and idolatrous and causing you to seek after things, who are lording over you, God absolutely hates it. Okay, he hates it. These people that act like that God is telling them stuff and they are completely ungoverned by God. They don't care about him. They seek after an idol, but they say that everything that comes out of their mouth is from the Lord. Uh uh. Listen to this who do not hold to this doctrine and who have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan. To you, I say, I do not lay on you any other burden. Let me show you another translation. And I hope you guys catch this. Now I say to the rest of you in Theotera, to you who do not hold to her teaching, to, to, the, to that woman that is teaching false motives of the heart, 
motives that are not governed by God, that are teaching you to seek after things that are unholy and to sell your birthright short to who you've been given the name of the Lord. You've been created to be a child of God and you're still governing yourself as if this is not true. But look at this. And have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets. I will not impose any other burden on you. So there are people, there are people that say, Thus saith the Lord this, thus saith the Lord that, thus saith the Lord this, thus saith the Lord that, the Lord told me this, the Lord is teaching me that. The... But they also teach you Satan's so called deep secrets. They, uh, instead of you learning about the true riches, because in him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Instead of you having the riches of the full assurance of understanding, understanding him, underst him being revealed in you, because this is what this is about, the revelation of Jesus Christ, the revelation of the truth. They're teaching you the so-called deep, secrets of Satan. They're teaching you the deep secrets of the adversary and acting like it's something that God wants you to know. Have you fully enticed? Have you fully seduced? They let me show you now. Let's go ahead and round this out to those of you who have lasted. I commend you. They speak loud boasts of their folly. They entice by sensual passions of the flesh those who are barely escaping, those who live in error. They promise you freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. Praise God. I'm glad you're getting this. They're promising you freedom, but what they're teaching you they're enslaved to. They're not even sure of the freedom they have in Christ Jesus. They're not even sure of the mystery of Christ. God hasn't even, Christ hasn't even been revealed in them. At any given moment, they're like, am I in bondage? Am I in bondage? Are you in bondage? Well, you're in bondage. That's why you need me to keep getting you out of bondage. If you not attach to me, thus saith the Lord, if you give me this offering, then that's how you get out of bondage. But don't grow far because I am your key to staying free. They're not teaching you the mystery. They're not revealing Christ in you. You, They are your source. And they teach you the deep the so-called deep things of Satan. They teach you the deep things of Satan. And, and he is not playing this. Thanks, Shay. Yeah, I decided to get back on it and finish this off. I didn't want to let the, the, the enemy stop me from getting this out tonight. So listen, listen, but unto you, in the rest of Theatera, as many are not of this doctrine, which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak, and actually let me go ahead and show it to you out of this, they have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, I will not impose any other burden on you except that you hold on to what you have until I come. Just keep doing the things that I've already commended you for, right? your deeds and your love and your faith and your service and your perseverance, and you're doing now more than you did at first. Just keep doing it. And what does he say? To the one who is victorious and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. So instead of you exalting yourself, right? Where is the exalted one? Remember what Jezebel actually means. Where is the exalted one? Where is my prince 
who I have no husband. I govern myself and say it's from God. No, but those who my servants that continue to serve me that are doing everything that I'm commending you for, I'm going to exalt you. You don't have to exalt yourself. You don't got to lord over people. You don't got to try to use people for gain. I'm going to exalt you. I'm going to give you authority over the nations that one will rule them. That one will rule them, the one that overcomes, the one that does not get deceived, the one that does not fall for the these the, the, the seduction of these false teachers and these false prophets that are trying to get us to go after our sensual lust, that are trying to get us to, to even... Even the itching ears of the doctrine of devils. We talked about that recently. The itching ears of, oh, I want to learn everything about Satan. That's sensuality. Get bored with Jesus. Listen, that one, the one that overcomes, he will rule with an iron scepter and will dash them to pieces like pottery. Right, the other nations or the ones that he's ruling over, just as I received authority from my father, and I will give to that one the morning star, meaning he will make him the brightest star. Because remember, he, the, the the stars are the leaders of the church, the stars are the 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 messengers of the church. So he's gonna make that one the morning star the one that does not fall into seduction, the one that just serves him, the one that just loves him. Jesus said it, whoever will be greatest among you is the one that is least. Whoever will be the greatest among you is that who will be the servant of all. But no, these false prophets, they're greedy. They exalt themselves. They do not serve the Lord. They serve false idols. Right? Do you understand this? Whoever has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. Let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. Jesus is intimately involved in building his church. And what we have to make sure is that we do not get seduced to fornication. We do not allow what these people are trying to come and entice us with because they will sell you out for their own personal gain. They will sell you out for their own personal exaltation. And thus saith the Lord the whole time. And that's why we have to guard our hearts because I Understand, I listen to a lot of information, a lot of teaching, a lot of doctrine. And we have to be very, very careful because that lust for money is strong. That lust for power is strong. These were the temptations of Jesus. If you're really the son of God, if you're really the son of God, turn this stone into bread. Mm -mm. No, 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 no. What, what do these false prophets do? Entice you, seduce you to eat food sacrificed to idols, to be sustained by something other than the Lord. God is going to give you the hidden manna. He's going to give you sustenance from on high. He's going to develop in you a drink that will bubble up in you into eternal life. He's going to give you meat that will cause you to never hunger again. He's, go he's going to sustain you. You don't have to serve that in order to be sustained. You can do exactly what God has called you to do. He called you to be in that job. He called you to work. If he, if he called you to work in a minimum wage job because you are called to be a light there and preach the gospel, he'll find a way to supply you. Or if he calls you to leave that job, to go and do something else, and that job is viewed as your sustenance, that's idolatry. 
if he calls you to leave that to go do something else, if he calls you to preach this, but if you preach this, you don't get crowds. You don't get you don't get the masses. You don't get the, the, the people that want the American dream gospel. You don't get the people that want to hear the deep things of Satan. You don't get those things. You don't get the masses. You don't get everyone running saying, set me free, set me free. Can you keep me free? Can you keep? You don't get that if you just preach the gospel. You don't get any of those crowds if you just preach the gospel. But are you going to succumb? Are you going to succumb to the seduction to preach those things just for the gain, just for the money, just for the exaltation? Just because how people look at you, oh my goodness, do you see them? They know all the hidden things of Satan. They know all of this. They know all of that. Oh, did you see them? Oh, they have this and they have that and they have this. Only Jesus knows. Only Jesus knows what's going on in people's hearts. But we have to be careful that we are paying attention to not be seduced. Do you guys understand this? I need you guys to understand this because the more wicked the world gets, the easier it is to twist that gospel. And all of a sudden, this sounds good. That sounds good. They look blessed. That sounds right. And I'm talking, me, Vic, anyone, you all of a sudden, and I'm like, I'm telling you, listen, man. All of a sudden, you hear someone that was preaching sound doctrine. They're Balaam. They have the true word of God. They have accurate prophecy. They're preaching the truth. And all of a sudden, they switch it up. They're saying some other stuff. And you're like, why did you switch up your gospel? Why are you, what? Oh. Why? Something's going on. They need that money. They need this. They need that. That's going to get ears. The itching ears. They know that the itching ears want this stuff. So they'll say it. They'll make merchandise of you. That's what Peter said. They will make merchandise of you for gain. And we have to be careful. We have to check our hearts. So as much as I'm preaching this for you, I'm preaching this for myself as someone that is just getting into this. As someone that's finally submitted to like, all right, I guess this is what you want me to do with my life, Lord. So as much as I'm preaching this for you, I'm preaching it for myself. Because it's the world we live in. It's the world we live in. Yes, amen. We definitely have to watch and pray. Right? So these false prophets, one is a true prophet, but he's a false prophet because he's greedy. He will sell you out just for money. He's actually called of God. The other one, don't know God at all. Evil heart. Not even joined to him whatsoever. Seducing you. Seducing us to go after things that are unholy. Just like Esau for a bowl of beans, lentils, soup, a meal. Sold his birthright who he was created to be. And now, can fornication also be sexual sin? Yes. Oh, man, that man is, ooh, he is this, he is that, he is this. Ooh, that girl is, ooh, she is this, ooh, she is that. Ooh, they're so handsome, they're so beautiful, they're so sexy, they're so sexy. They look like uh, they really love God. They look like they really got. He said Jesus three times. She said she's a Proverbs 31 woman. Neither one of them care about God at all whatsoever, but you'll sell out God's calling on your life so that you can have a companion. 
or so that you can feel a moment, a, a moment of, of, of lust, right? By fornicating with someone, by committing adultery on your spouse, by, by uh, sleeping with, uh, if you're in a position of power, by sleeping with the laity, by any, any, so many things. And all of a sudden, what God called you to be, because remember what Peter said, they caused the way of the truth to be blasphemed. So now what God called us to be, people are getting hurt by it because we needed that moment to fill that temporary need. We needed that moment to fill the flesh. And all of a sudden, everything that God called you to be starts crumbling down. And then people look at it and they blaspheme the way of the truth. This, I, What kind of God are they serving? I don't want to serve him. All of those, right? That's what they say nowadays. All of those preachers are this. All of those preachers are that. But the fornication is not just in the fact that you committed a sexual act. The fornication is in the fact that you sold yourself out. You sold who God created you to be. You gave it up. You wasted your energy. You wasted your efforts. Not on building, not on growing, not on what God called you to be, but on that. On that which is profane, unholy, uh, uh, not worth being trod over, trodden over, it says. That is what fornication actually means. And once we realize that, it becomes a lot easier not to fornicate. Because it has much, much greater significance. It's not just, oh, that's not something I should do because God calls it bad. It's, oh, that's not something I should do because I'm selling my, I'm selling my soul. I'm selling my birthright. I'm selling out who God created me to be. Like he has given me his name. And in, in that, it's adultery. Because I belong to the one. He calls me his bride. He calls me his possession. And I'm giving my efforts to that. So you see, okay, and I want you to get to catch what I'm saying. Wasting my efforts, giving my efforts, dividing my efforts, dividing my energy. Wasting my energy. That's fornication. You putting in all that work, you're spilling your seed in something that is not even holy. And what comes out of it? Not Israel, like Jacob, Israel, his seed ended in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Where did Esau seed go? We don't know some unholy Canaanite women that God told him don't marry, that, that Isaac told him don't marry. He married him anyway. Where did his seed end up? We don't know. Nobody knows. No one cares. He sold his birthright for some for some for a meal, food. He wasted his efforts. He wasted his energy on food. That's fornication. So many people doing all of this work, all of this effort, all of this stuff on something God didn't call them to do. Fornication. God created you. And I'm not even just saying everyone has to be in the fivefold type of ministry. 
I'm saying whatever he called you to be. Well, you know what? I, 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 well, because I want this in life and because I want that in life and because I, I like being here, because it can be so many different, a myriad of things. And the point is, is it what God created you for? Or is it the lust of your own heart? Is it what you want? And then you convince yourself that this is what God, <laughs> people do that every day, convince themselves that, oh yeah, God told me, God told me, God didn't tell you that. God didn't tell you that. It's just what we want to do. And then it settles our hearts to say it's from God. That woman. She calls herself a prophetess, but the one with the eyes of the flame of fire, he searches the hearts and the intents. He searches the reins in the hearts. He sees what's driving you. He sees the motivations. And like I said, these are things that I've been sitting on as someone that really wants to do this, as this someone that this is really becoming real to me, like, oh, wow. Like, I'm, like I preach the gospel. Like people's lives are being impacted. Like people care what I say. Like it holds weight to them. And I'm gonna have to do this for the rest of my life. That I got to think about that. Because you know how easy it is to be enticed? You know how easy it is to be seduced? You know how easy it is to look around and say, oh, well, that looks like it's successful. What's successful? What God says is successful. So I can't just thus saith the Lord you. I can't just tell you God said. I can't just preach what you want to hear. I can't just preach what gets me gained. Can't do any of that. You guys get this? You guys understand this? All right. Praise the Lord Jesus. Sure is. All right. So I wanted to go through this. I wanted to go through this. I know it's a little something different than I usually get into. But I felt it was necessary for the things that I see going on on these apps, right? The fact that I am involved in this, I see that once you scroll off of me, there's something else telling you, someone else telling you something. And it's very easy to seduce your heart. It's very easy to sell you out. And I want you to just be careful. I just want you to be careful. Now, you don't necessarily have to judge the people. Jesus will take care of that, right? He will remove people. He will remove the church. What you have to watch is how it affects you. What you have to watch is your own heart. What you have to watch is you don't get caught up. What you have to watch is that you don't become one. Jesus knows his church. And some people, he's like, ah, they're not even in ministry. The world calls them a minister. They're not in ministry. There's some people, he's like, they are in ministry, but they're not doing. Go through and read. He will commend. He will rebuke. The same exact church. This church is doing great, but there's some things I have against you. And we always have to reflect, make sure we're governed by him, make sure we're listening to him, make sure we're ready to repent, make sure we're, we, we are not just in this for our own glory, but for the glory of the Lord. All right, so I know this was definitely different than what we usually bring. We'll get back to preaching the gospel uh, next week. 
Um, but I want people to understand that you just watch what your heart is seeking after. Watch what you're spending your energies on. Watch what you're spending your effort doing. Because you don't want to sell out your birthright. You don't want to sell out who God has created you to be as his child, as the bride of Christ, as those called to represent him. You're called to be his people. You're called to be his children. And we don't want to sell ourselves. We don't want to prostitute ourselves. We don't want to whore ourselves out for something unholy just to fulfill a momentary satisfaction, just to fulfill a momentary need. We don't want to do that. And I don't want you to do that because in those places, sometimes it's hard to get that, that condemnation Praise the Lord Jesus that you will find a place of repentance. If if we ever got into that situation, that there will be a place of repentance, but some people don't find it. It never gets back to what it could have been. They just go on to lead a life. Because they sold out. Right? You guys understand that? All right. So I appreciate everyone who came back after those first two live streams failed. That was that was rough. I was like, all righty then. Um, and I appreciate everyone that endured this. I went a little faster because I've already said like the first part three times. Um, but you know, we'll we'll come back to this in about a year or so maybe even six months and yeah and i'm even thinking about appreciate you q uh i'm even thinking about just doing a video specifically on jezebel because that's going to get some attention we know how people love to learn about jezebel and just to show the reality of who she really is and what that is really about All right because people people if people focus on the sexual sin and people focus on these other things, they don't realize what's at the root of it so that they can really look out for the problem. So that they can really see what's the problem. The problem is you can't tell me what to do. I'm going to do what I want. And I'm going to say that what I'm doing is from God. <laughs> That's that's the problem. That's the problem. That's a dangerous person. That's a dangerous person. And it's a, she seduces you. When I say she, I don't mean the one. I'm saying the, it's a, the seductress is the one that seduces your heart. That's for a man or a woman. Okay. So that thing, she seduces you. And she gets you to commit fornication. She gets you through her seduction to sell yourself. You prostitute yourself for that. So now who cares what God has called me to? I need that. Who cares what God created me to be? I need that. Who cares what God is telling me to do? I want that. And I will sell out the truth. I will sell out the real. I will sell out the actual for the profane, for the false reality, for the... You see what I'm saying? So that's the truth of how Jezebel operates. That's the truth. It's a heart thing. Now, does that act out in sexual sin? Yes, yes, it does act out in sexual sin because it has that false image of God. That false God, it has a false image of itself and it has a false image of you. 
So therefore, I can treat you like any old thing because I don't know the love of God. I can treat myself like any old thing because I don't know the love of God. So yes, it acts out in that way as well, but that's not what it primarily is. It's void of the, of the, the prince, the divine one, the true God. Is ungoverned, does whatever it wants, whatever it pleases. I do what I want. She's independent. We're not independent. I have the spirit of God. I can't do what I want when I want. Sometimes I forget. Sometimes I start acting up. Sometimes I start getting mad. Sometimes I start saying things. Then I remember, oh, snap, I'm not alone. Oh, snap. I'm supposed to be led, governed by the spirit in me. I'm supposed to walk in the spirit. I'm supposed to keep in step with the spirit. I can't just do what I want. I can't just do what I want. Galatians chapter five. Why? Because I'm supposed to be led by him. And that's what Jezebel does. She does what she wants. She governs herself. But she'll still call herself a prophetess. And this is in regard to the church. Y'all got that? All right. So does anyone have any questions? Then we're going to go ahead and uh, finish this up. Does anyone have any questions? Hey, Shanetta, I appreciate you. And everyone, all, all the other uh, 12 people that are in here right now. All right. So any questions before we get off? I know I went kind of quickly. You guys go back and, um, you know, read all of Second Peter, read all of Jude, so that you can see how these pro false prophets, how they operate, how they uh, entice people, how they seduce people, how they trick people. that's what it says, bro. Right. So now you're going to make me share my screen uh, again. Um, that's what it says, right? They promise freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption, right? They promise freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption for whatever overcomes a person to that he is enslaved, right? And it goes on right here. For after they have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome. And the last state is worse than that of the first. Right. So definitely go and read all of uh, Second Peter chapter two, because it really explains these false prophets that exploit you for greed, that merchandise you for greed. Um, and yeah, man, it's it's it's. And they don't value the grace of God. They rather teach you the depths of Satan. That blew my mind when I read that. <laughs> because we talk about that all the time. They teach you the so-called depths of Satan instead of the grace of God, instead of the true riches, instead of the mystery of Christ in you. And instead of revealing Christ in you, they reveal everything about Satan. You don't need to know the depths of Satan. You did go quick, and this isn't something we can just glance over. Thank you so much. Yes, I definitely did go quick, only because uh, this is this was my third attempt. <laughs> we want to go deeper, man. Yeah, for real. You're talking. You're talking about into into that definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so we 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 might go again because this is very serious, and you you're 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 right, Q. Um, you're right. This is not something that we can just glance over. Uh, this is one of the most sobering uh, messages that I've probably uh, brought. 
um, and is very sobering for me. It's something I've been thinking about for the last three weeks or so as I'm sitting here like, man, I'm like, I'm committed to this now. Yeah, yeah, that's what I, I know what you're saying. Yeah, that's what they say. I knew what you meant, bro. My bad. Yeah, that's what they say. They want to go deeper into the things of Satan. I knew what you meant, bro. Um, yeah, yeah, because you got it. You got it in quotes. Yeah, like that. Uh, but yeah, this is one of the the. This was very sobering to me. Um, and there's a lot more rebukes uh, for those of us that want to preach the gospel. There's a lot more rebukes, but I really wanted to just get people, the people to understand what fornication actually means, right? Like I said, at the beginning of the first one, um, I, this started as me, I was just going to teach men specifically and women would understand, uh, you know, benefit from it, but I was going to teach men what fornication actually is so that they don't sell themselves out from, for, for, for not God's calling to pursue what they think a man is supposed to be, to pursue random women, to give uh, someone, a woman that is not uh, of God, all of these type of things, right? Because Esau actually, go back and read uh, Genesis, go back and read Genesis. Esau purposefully married Canaanite women just because Isaac told Jacob not to. So whenever, whenever he saw that this is going to make his dad unhappy because he himself sold out his birthright, he purposefully married unholy women. Purposefully. Right. And that's no one's heart here, but you have to check yourself. Because I talk and listen to people every day and, and, and you could do something and and mess your life up and then in a moment try to blame God for your own error and then continue in that downward cycle of just ruining and self-sabotage. And it's all selling your yourself your 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 created value who god called you to be you are being his child and you'll just sell it all out in this emotional whirlwind right yes selling yourself cheap yes 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 i didn't even look down but yeah that's exactly what we're talking about we always on the same page right and we, we, you, you like, like food, sex, right? Those are the two primary ones. Food, sex. No, that's not worth who God created you to be. Money. That's not worth who God created you to be. Be who God created you to be. And let him take care of you. What is the teaching of the depths of Satan? Now that I have not necessarily, uh, and, and this is what I mean, because this is what I do not like to do. This is what I do not like to do. I do not like to create context of my own. So in the context of this, in the context of this, I'm not exactly sure what they call the deep, the so-called deep things of Satan. Let me go ahead and pull this up. To those of you who have not learned the so-called deep things of Satan, I will not impose any other burden. So in the context of what he's talking about here, I'm not exactly sure, but what I do know from real experience, and I will separate the two, okay? So, so don't insert what I'm saying into the, the scripture. What I do know from real experience is that there are people that are next level carnal. Every day you hear them say, thus saith the Lord. They hear from the Lord every single day, every emotion, every thought, every feeling, they thus saith the Lord. 
this woman Jezebel that calls herself a prophetess. And those same people, they do not actually teach the gospel. They teach the depths of Satan. They teach you got to learn about this and you got to learn about this and you got to learn about that and you got to learn about that or else you're not going to be able to stay free. And if you open up a door and if you open up this and you open up that and all you, you don't even learn about Jesus. You never even really learn about the truth that keeps you free. You're just learning about all of Satan's little tactics. And that's not how this not how this really works. And you guys are going to have to watch some of our other videos or even Vic's videos so that you can understand what I actually mean by this. And, and what you're learning is the depths of Satan instead of him who is hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And they don't teach you the gospel. And this is why they promise you freedom, but you're never really free because freedom is in Christ Jesus. So we talk to these people every single day and you try to tell them what you just said contradicted the gospel. It's not just we believe on Jesus Christ. It's what Jesus Christ actually accomplishes in delivering us from sin and giving us and making us a new creation and placing his spirit in us and creating us after God in righteousness and true holiness. It's the revelation of the mystery. And every day we talk to people that don't understand the revelation of the mystery and what the gospel actually declares and the righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel, but they know everything about the devil. They know everything about the devil. They know more about the devil than the Bible knows about the devil. They get on the app and they tell you, no, this is not in the Bible. This came from my personal experience. So they're going to tell you that their anecdotal experience and you need to put your trust in that. And the whole time, what you need is the truth. And that truth will make you free. And you'll be able to spot the lies of the devil. You'll be able to spot the lies of Satan because you're firm and established in the truth. So you're able to stand firm in the faith and you quench all the fiery darts of the evil one. But because they don't actually teach that, because they're not firm in it themselves, every day you're in bondage. Every day you're worried. Every day you're scared. It's not righteousness, joy, and peace in the Holy Ghost. It's fear and worry and anxiety. And I wonder if the devil, and I wonder where the devil, and is he over there? And is the devil over there? And oh my goodness, and does he have me? And what's going on? And the whole time you don't even trust Jesus. The whole time you're not even, you don't have the riches of the assurance. Uh, you don't have the assurance of the riches of the knowledge that's in Christ Jesus. Right? Yeah, th that's what I'm talking about. That's that's what I'm talking about, bro. The the the, the deliverance ministry most. Yes, that's exactly they, they don't teach the truth. And I have nothing against deliverers or casting out demons. My problem is the people that don't know Jesus. They, they, they use the name of Jesus. They know Jesus died for their sins, but they don't have understanding. Right? So they don't have the comfort being knit together in love unto all the riches of the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of Christ, of the mystery of God, right? So let me go ahead and switch translation so that you guys hear this. And I'm glad you guys asked this question. So they don't have, their hearts may be encouraged being knit together in love to reach all the riches a full assurance of understanding. So what is the riches? The riches is the full assurance of understanding of the mystery and knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ. It's not the depths of Satan. In whom Christ, in whom Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, not the deep things of Satan. 
Your freedom is not in learning the deep things of Satan. Your freedom is in learning Christ. It's the revelation of Christ. Right? And the point is that no one deludes you with plausible arguments. Well, you know what? Well, you know what? This is why you're not free. Where's that in the Bible? Oh, no, I, this is from my experience. This is what I learned. Wait, no, 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 no. The Bible says that Jesus did set me free. No, no, the reason you're not really experiencing freedom is because of because I didn't pray th this. No, once you waken to the truth, once you see what Christ accomplished, you're free. Yes, the peace. They actually teach paranoia. Some of you guys seen that recent video I did. They have you paranoid, spiritual paranoia. Every day you worry that you're still not hidden, that you're not hidden in Christ anymore. Listen, you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And they preach a gospel that makes it seem like you cannot be hidden with Christ in God at any given moment. They preach a gospel as if you are even still alive. They're not even sure that they are crucified with Christ. That it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. They'll still tell you that you have a curse on your life. Listen to that. Y'all got me rolling now. They still tell you that you have a curse on your life after you got saved. And they'll use your actions as justification. So you're using a carnal logic, meaning you're looking with your eyes, not spiritual logic, meaning that Deshaun is dead and my life is now hid with Christ and God. And the life that, let me show you guys another verse. So if you've been raised with Christ, seek these things which are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above and not on things of the earth, for you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, appears. So who is your life? So who? So, so who, Christ is your life. You dead. Yeah, you dead. You've been crucified with Christ. This is the gospel. It's no longer you who live, but Christ lives in you. In the life you now live in the flesh, you live by the faith of the Son of God who loved you and gave himself for you. So now, not only are you dead, but your entire life is hid with Christ in God. And when Christ who, so Christ is your life, you don't even have a life of your own anymore. You don't even have a life of your own anymore. And these people convince Christians because they're not teaching the truth that actually sets people free. So now you're in this bondage of still trying to live after in the old man, even though you're in the new man. And because we're not teaching that, we go through these cycles of sin because we're still living as if we don't, we're not walking in the truth. We're not walking in the light as he's in the light. We're not abiding in him, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? what the gospel declares and what the gospel preaches. So you, what you do is you'll determine by your actions what a spiritual reality is, but that's carnally minded. And to be carnally minded is death. So at any given moment, what you're going to do is look and make a determination of what is true instead of understanding the truth and letting that truth enforce the reality. So, oh, because you did X, Y, Z, you're in bondage. And now I'm going to pray you out of bondage, but that's not how it works. That's why Paul says, why are you committing fornication? Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Your body is not going to be his temple afterward or after we do something. You need to recognize that your body is his temple and stop the fornication. That's called being spiritually minded.
That's not me saying, oh man, y'all keep going up to this temple and fornicating with the prostitutes in that temple. Therefore, you're not really saved and I got to break a bondage. That's not what Paul did. Paul said, you're not getting it. You're not seeing clearly. You don't know the truth. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, which you have from God and you've been bought with a price? Therefore, honor God with your body and your spirit, which both belong to him. This is all the truth. And now that you understand that truth, that truth will set you free. That truth will make you act right. But I'm not going to preach something to you that makes you think that the truth is not the truth and that you're still in bondage to the devil and that you haven't been delivered out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. And learning the depths of Satan is the exact opposite of learning the depths of everything that I just said in these last five minutes. And these people learn the depths of Satan. And at any given moment, they untrust the gospel. They unbelieve the gospel. And they think they're fighting him. And in reality, he is gloating. He is loving it. They boast in their folly. Look at this. Look at this. For speaking loud boasts of folly, they entice by sensual passions of the flesh those who are barely escaping those from those who live in error. They promise freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. They themselves are actually worried that Satan can take them out of the bosom of God, that Satan can is more powerful than Jesus at any given moment, dependent on them. And they entice people that have barely escaped freedom. And they're telling you, by the sensual, the flesh is the carnal mind that makes decisions based on feelings and how things look in human logic. And they're telling you, you're only free for as much as you can stay free. And it all depends on what you're doing. If you don't read your Bible for 45 minutes every day, pray for 35 minutes every day, fast every quarter. Oh, and then you didn't read your Bible. Oh my goodness. Did I open the door to the devil? No, we do this so we can understand. We do this so we can commune. We do this so we can grow. We don't do this as if it's determining our freedom. Jesus determines our freedom. And they put your confidence in yourself, not in Jesus, not in the truth, in everything but. And they themselves are still, they promise you freedom, but they don't even give you freedom. They make you contingent and hooked on them. Actually, you got to sow a seed. You got to sow a seed for your freedom. Just to confirm your, you telling me that the blood of Jesus didn't confirm my freedom? Me giving you my money is what confirmed my freedom? Thanks, Balaam. Thanks for making merchandise of me. Do you see? Facts. And we're not supposed to be ignorant, but ignorant is different. Ignorant is understanding the deception, but you don't understand the deception until you're grounded in the truth. You see? So they think that they're fighting Satan all the time. And meanwhile, Satan is like, <laughs> they've been, they dealing with me all day. They ain't even thinking about Jesus. They just worried about me. They're in fear. They don't have any joy. They don't have any peace. They're not confident in Jesus. They're, they, 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 they think that this circumstance that I have them in means that God doesn't even love them anymore. They're actually using this situation to think that, that Jesus has lost hold of them. 
because some people are being insulting, because they've experienced some tribulation. Have you read the tribulation that the disciples experienced, that the apostles experienced? Satan is loving it. You're consumed with him. You think about him day and night, not Jesus. All right, I'm done. I'm done. You asked, though. You asked. You asked. That woman Jezebel, ungoverned by God. God told me. God told me. God, God didn't tell you that. I know the God. I heard the gospel. I heard the gospel. What you just said was contrary to the gospel. God did not tell you that. Stop lying. Well, you know, um, and 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 I learned that uh, this right here can. Where is that in the Bible? At? Where is that in the Bible? Oh no, you got to be led by the Spirit. The Spirit didn't tell you that, because the Spirit testifies of Jesus. He's the spirit of truth. What you just said contradicted what Jesus accomplished. What you just said contradicts what Jesus accomplished, and the spirit is only testifying of the truth. The spirit testifies, Hebrews chapter 10, that he has forgiven once for all. That where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. And you want me to give an offering for the release of whatever is holding me in. Jesus did that. His blood did that. You put in too much confidence in me and you and not enough confidence in the blood of Christ. And I still have a guilty conscience. So instead of me being secure and me having a a, a conscience that is clear because I'm trusting in him, not I'm not trusting in myself because I'm fully confident in what he has done. So now instead of me having a clear conscience and saying, thank you, Lord Jesus, that I have peace with God, that I have the joy of my salvation, that no matter what I go through, I know that you are my Lord and you have delivered me from the power and the penalty of sin. No, 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 no. You still have me like, I wonder if I'm really saved. I wonder if God is mad at me. I wonder, I I, I think God did this to me. That's right. This is God punishing me for what I just did. That doesn't make sense. Because there's no condemnation in Christ. How can I be punished? Now, I can have a negative outcome. I can sow to the flesh and reap the the destruction. But that's not God doing that to me. That wouldn't even make sense for what Jesus accomplished. It's crazy. And they teach you this stuff and they come up with it through human logic. And it all contradicts the gospel. Thinking about the story of Job, I honestly think Satan says and thinks those things. Uh, uh, Yes. So um, we'll touch it. I'll just mention this in bypassing it, and I'm going to go ahead and close and go out. But the story of Job, two very important things. One, when God says, dost thou look upon my servant Job? If you read the Young's literal translation, it says, have you set your heart against my servant Job because there is none like him? So it's not God pointing Job out. It's God revealing Satan's heart because he's the accuser. And when Satan shows up, he says, well, I've been going to and fro throughout the earth. I've been walking up and down in it. He says, and have you set your heart against my servant Job because there is none like him? And then Job actually says that God did all of these things to him. Even though reading the story, we understand that Satan did these things to him. And at the end of the story, we see that Job says that I have uttered words without knowledge. I don't understand how the world works. I don't understand this. I don't understand that. I am a foolish man. But understand this. This is a book 
in the books of wisdom, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. These are books of wisdom. And the wisdom in Job is that it's one of the few books in the Old Testament that reveals we have an adversary. But we should never compare ourselves to Job because we don't know what covenant Job had. Because Job, though it's sitting where it sits at in our Bibles, Job was not under the old covenant. He definitely was not under our covenant. He was just a man in the earth. This is why Satan, everything that he had was actually in Satan's hand. This was even before God came to Abraham and called Abraham out from among those uh, uh, pagan worshipers to make a people of his own. Job was living before that. The only other place the name Job is seen is as a grandson of Noah. We don't know if it's the same Job, but the only other place that that name is mentioned is a grandson of Noah. This is this is not a covenant that is a, a promise or of even a conditional type of covenant like the like the the law of Moses that if you do right then and if you don't then this is just a man on the on the fallen world, and God actually protects Job. Listen, everything he has is in your hand. But don't touch his person. Listen, everything he has is in your hand, but, but don't kill him. I'm not going to let you kill him, but he, I mean, he's, he's yours. He lives there, but we've been redeemed out of the power of darkness. And we've been translated after the kingdom of darkness. And we've been translated into the kingdom of his dear son. We're not under that whatever Job was under. We're not under the old covenant. We're under the covenant that Jesus Christ shed with his own blood. Our life is hid with Christ in God. So I hope that helped you guys with Job. I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but don't read it through that lens and don't ever read yourself into that. Don't read yourself into anything but what Christ has brought us into. When you read the Bible, read it for what it is. It's a story of how Christ, uh, how Adam fell. God made a promise. God fulfilled that promise in calling Abraham and making that promise to Abraham. He was faithful to that promise through this nonsense that these people that he chose kept fornicating and committing adultery and not serving him. And he fulfilled that promise. And now all the nations of the world are blessed through Christ Jesus. And we have received the promise of his spirit. So read the story, learn the story, understand the story, read the biography, the gospels, read the poems. But stop acting like the Bible is about you. All right? Don't 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 read it like that. Don't read Job and be like, "Oh, this is happening because something happened to Job." That's, that doesn't even make sense. Number 1, your name isn't Job. That happened to Job. That happened to Job then. We're not Job. We're in Christ. Just coming up with stuff, making up stuff, human logic, worse than Job, uttering words without knowledge, just like Job did. Uttering words without knowledge, just like Job did. The craziest thing is Satan still has all of that same view of us. He thinks that you'll curse God to his face anytime you 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 endure a little bit of hardship. He's, he hasn't changed. He hasn't changed. Thank God our situation has changed, but he hasn't changed. He doesn't trust you. He doesn't think you really love God. He's going to accuse you day and night. He's going to say anything possible to get you to not trust the Lord, to get you to not trust the gospel, to get you to believe the gospel isn't true. He's going to use by any means necessary. That's why you have to be grounded in the truth. 
Because like I said, if you learn the depths of Satan, you'll think you're actually fighting the devil. And in doing that, you're actually believing not the gospel. You're actually believing that he has somehow done something to remove you from the safety that Jesus has brought you into. And you use life circumstances to determine that which is carnally minded, which is death, instead of spiritually minded, which is life and peace. That's why the apostles, they can be in jail singing. That's why the apostles can get beat and stare into the glory of God in heaven. That's why the apostles can get beat down and wake up the next day and keep going. Because it's life and peace. None of that changed what my Lord has done for me. None of that changed this eternal inheritance that I have received. None of that has changed that death does not have any dominion over me. I will never die. It's lost its sting. So I don't have to be in fear of what you think. I don't have to be in fear of what they think. I don't have to be in fear of synagogue of Satan. I don't have to be in fear of none of that stuff. Because the truth doesn't change depending on my circumstances. So I don't make decisions or determinations based on my circumstances because that's where Satan reigns. So don't fall for his nonsense. All right? All right. I love you guys. I love you so much. I hope that little spiel on Job made sense. And we just went, what, a whole like 50 minutes, 45 minutes on this. Yeah. So um, I appreciate everything. Yeah, we can definitely be our own worst enemies. That's where the devil reigns. He, 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 he is the false accuser. He is the, he's the voice that convinces you that the gospel is not true. And it comes so many different ways. And that's why you have to be grounded on the word of God, because that's what you live by. That never changes. It never changes. All right. All right. So I love you. Um, I appreciate everyone that came back. Uh, those of you that are watching the replay, uh, thank you for your patience. Um, and yeah, I appreciate you all so, so very much. And I'll see y'all next time.